research proposals. How do you go about crafting a winning research proposal? A proposal that's gonna get you attention, possibly even money, scholarships, get you into the right place, find you a connection with a perfect supervisor and mentor who's gonna see you through your project. Guys, crafting a perfect research proposal is not just some rare gift bequeathed by the gods, but that you need a system a program in place that can help you do it. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. And you've come to the right place if you need to do a research proposal because I'm gonna lift the lid and share the secrets um, using my gift method, a method that I have shared with my students at Oxford, Harvard, Cambridge, and now Bocconi and Milan, where I'm a full professor, a method I've shared with them over the years that's helped them win again and again and again. Getting this proposal right for you is like having money in the bank. And I apply this personally. I just uh, won a competitive 2 million euro grant from the European Research Council um, and I've won competitive research funding all over the world. I'm gonna teach you here the gift system that has the essential ingredients, um, the system that was taught to me when I was a graduate student and I've adapted it and evolved it over the years to make it more relevant to you. This system is going to be so simple. You can use it as a checklist. If you've already written your research proposal, you can apply this checklist now to make sure those ingredients are there. So what I'm gonna do in this video is I'm first gonna tell you what these elements of the gift system are so you know them, know what you need to do. And then I'm gonna go through a practical example with you. We're gonna look at a research proposal that a student has sent to me, and we're gonna see to what extent those elements are there. And if they're not there, what do we need to do to get them there? So this is gonna be a fun session. It's gonna have that both that kind of theory meets practice element so that you can use this in your life and apply it now and forever to construct winning proposals and win millions, no exaggeration, millions of euros and dollars like I've done. So I'm gonna turn over the computer and let's dive straight in. Okay, so I'm here at a whiteboard and let's go in. The gift method is going to have a few essential ingredients that you're going to want to understand um, and apply. So each letter has a specific meaning, and uh, let, let's go through this together. So the G in gift is the all-important gap. You need to identify what space in the field, what big gaping hole you want to plug. You're going to need to set that out and make sure that's crystal clear to everyone looking at your proposal. If they don't know what the gap is, they're really gonna struggle to understand what the next part is. And the next part of your gift, and I like this idea of this, it's your research proposal is your gift to scholars in your, in your field, um, is, is gonna be your winning idea. This could be an intervention, it could be uh, all sorts of things, but really the eye in this is your idea. And you are gonna need to put in contact the gap in your field with your idea. This has to be communicated clearly. Um, the research proposal and its success lives or dies by the clarity of this idea. If people can understand that the gap is important and if they can understand that your idea can make a real contribution here and add value, um, you've done about 70% of the hard work. The next part in, in GIFT that's really important though, that, that comes out all the time, um, is, is going to be, and that is going to be this F component, and that is feasibility. On the screen, so there we go, feasibility. Um, so feasibility is really now, so you, you've convinced in your proposal that you've got, a, you've got a clear gap, you've got a good idea to address it, now you need to convince them you can actually do it. You need to provide enough detail to show them, yeah, this is feasible. I can really deliver on the goods. I can deliver what I'm promising and setting out to do. Um, so you need to satisfy that F component feasibility. And the last thing that I like to, to put in here, and it's kind of linked to feasibility, is time. Um, it really helps to show that you've got an action plan to say, yeah, I've got a three-year timeline. I can really do it. And here I have mapped out, sometimes students like to use Gantt charts or other ways of showing their timeline, but mapped out a timeline that you have constructed a roadmap, you have a realistic plan. It's good practice for you to make sure you haven't bit off more than you can chew. And uh, so many grants, I mean, I've been on the other side as a reviewer of so many grants, so many research proposals, they get rejected because the idea is not clear 
or they just haven't convinced me that they can really do what they're gonna get funding to do. And you need to be aware of this. When you're getting a PhD, you are effectively getting funding for your project, whether that's directly your supervisor's paying you, your institution's paying you, it's coming from taxpayer dollars, it's distributed to you. Um, there's funding involved. There's a cost to your training and you need to convince them why they're gonna want to invest in you. And this gift is a secret formula that's gonna help you do it. So with that, I wanna go through and I find it, this always helps my students to see real live examples in practice. And let's look together. We're gonna not read the whole proposal. We are gonna just kind of like a laser beam hone in and focus on where are these elements of gift that we can see. And if they're not there, how can we make them strong? So I've got the document up here and a big thanks to Samantha for sharing this with us and being willing to open it up to the community for our mutual benefit. And by the way, if you haven't joined Fast Track Grad, my support and mentorship group for students and researchers, do that now. The link is below. Um, you're not going to want to miss out. We have live trainings every Friday where we roll up our sleeves and we get into your papers together. Um, it is one of the, the best resources available where you can get a high level professor with decades of experience like myself there to support you and really tap the power of community. So let's dive in. So let's start with the title. Um, do black Americans' perceptions of mental health providers' openness to spirituality impact black Americans' mental health se ugh, help seeking attitudes? Okay, guys, if you're struggling with your title, this is especially true uh, if English is not your first language. If you're running out of breath saying your title um, or uh, you think it sounds a little weird, that's a sign that it's probably not as simple and clear as it could be. We don't want to dumb it down, but we wanna keep it as simple as possible. It's just gonna help people already understand what's the gap, what's the big idea, uh, and, and help you avoid the problem of being misunderstood. And, and that's one of the most frustrating things. Like, gradually, I'm so brilliant, but and nobody understands me. Nobody understands my genius. Um, so keep it, keep it simple, just assume people are, assume they're dumb. Okay, let's go through. So we're looking for the gift elements. We're gonna go through and look for the gap. So uh, let's see, already the first sentence, it seems to be, be showing a gap. Despite comparable levels of uh, psychological disorders, black uh, Americans have been reported to utilize mental health services at lower rates. So black Americans are just not getting access to mental health services, okay. Um, and here's another potential gap, and I'm gonna zoom in so you guys can see this a little better. While spirituality is seen as an important dimension, the role of spirituality and wellness is often not viewed with the same level of importance, so that could also be a gap. Um, let's keep going down. We're gonna look for the idea and see if there's any other signs of gaps. Um, when you do this a lot, you kind of hone in like a laser beam and can find it. Okay, this is saying it's important to better understand perceptions of openness and how it may impact. The overarching goal is to explore the impact. So I'm seeing two potential gaps, but it's not really clear. Let's look at the aim. Examine the associations between distress, humility, and mental health seeking. So that's not really coming into contact with the potential gap here, the, that spirituality and wellness is not given the same level of importance, or the potential gap mentioned up here, uh, that black Americans are not accessing mental health services at the same rate as other racial groups. So really, my first major comment here is need to clearly articulate the gap. And in that important point of that gap coming into connection with the idea is it's just not here. There's, there's a disconnect between these two potential gaps. I don't want, if you have two potential gaps, make it clear, um, but it's not coming into play with this idea. And, and I'm really concerned about this idea here. Examine the associations uh, among psychological distress, spiritual humility, and mental health help seeking. I, I don't fully understand the hypothesis, and, and, and this has a risk of threatening feasibility as well. This could be a lifelong endeavor to explore this system, how this complex interplay works. This is opening up so much that uh, you really wanna be concrete, specific, and definite in your proposal. That's really what sets us apart as scientists from the general public. So this worries me, um, and you can see this overarching, the idea here is to explore the impact of psychological distress and clinicians clinician spiritual humility, what does this mean that maybe psychological distress is gonna prevent people from seeking help? Um, I'm not sure. Or maybe perceptions of their spiritual humility, if they think they're, they're more humble in their spirituality, they'll, they'll seek help for mental health care. 
I'm not sure. So this is this is confusing. Um, so already some some challenges here, like I said, in the gap and putting the idea simply in that gap. And again, if I'm not seeing this, others are going to look at this proposal very, very quickly and make snap judgments. It needs to jump out. The other thing I'm already spotting, guys, remember our writing training uh, using the peer system where you have a point that then needs to be backed up by the meat of the evidence and the examples. Uh, you'll see some links below to our peer system and other writing training. It's really going to help you achieve that clarity um, so that your ideas can get a, a fair pass, a fair shake. So people will really look at them for what they're worth. Um, so always in your research proposals, all our writing tips that you're going to find on this channel apply. Let me keep going to feasibility. Can you convince us that you're actually going to be able to do this? Yeah, and this is, again, same thing, same thing here. This is a, a little bit vague. This is a little bit clearer. The psychological distress will positively predict help-seeking attitudes, but that doesn't really connect to this aim. So yeah, definitely you're gonna need to clear that up. I'm gonna keep going and looking for um, here and now going into aims. Different departments have different ways that they're gonna want you to set this up. I like setting up these proposals to avoid redundancy, by the way, and be as linear as possible. So feasibility, um, this is all good. It's uh, very helpful to set up a conceptual framework for your paper. I'm not getting into that, I'm just checking here what the main elements are. Um, looking for something about feasibility, convincing me you can actually do this. I'm still going looking for feasibility. This is all background. One thing that people miss in writing a proposal is you need to propose. So that's different from writing papers you, you maybe have done it in the past. You need to actively say, okay, here's all this background. How does this relate to my research? So all, this sen all these paragraphs here, what is this, how is this related to the research proposal? What are you proposing? And that is really missing. There's lots of background here that, great, background, it reads like a student paper, but it doesn't read like a proposal. So uh, I'm skipping over this because I just want to get to feasibility. And lots of background here, and that might be great to show you have mastery of the field, but you need to always frame that. That was all kind of, you're taking your reader by the hand and driving them to say, gap, here's my idea. Here's how I can prove to you I can actually do it. And um, so this is just lots of background. And, there's actually some, uh, and actually I could see from a colleague of the student, they're, they're kind of pointing this out, making the connection uh, in the sides about um, connecting it to the research question. Okay, hang on a second. Here we go, I think we might have, nope. I was thinking we might be getting to a survey. This is 58 pages, so this is quite long. And this is also, by the way, this is way, way too long. This is kind of a literature review and research proposal Put together present study. Okay, we're finally at the the present study. Um, methods. Good. Now this is where you have the chance to get into the detail necessary to prove you can do it. So it's coming from a larger study, we don't know what that larger study is. So you need to specify that, and and you need to specify feasibility. Are you depending on a larger study? If that so, if that larger study is not successful, uh, is yours going to completely flop? What's your role in this study? So that's big threat to feasibility right away. Um, recruitment, so who's conducting this? Um, this is one of the challenges of writing passive voice. It's just really unclear who's doing what. Um, who's do doing this directing? I, I just think it's better. I know a lot of you have been said, well, we're objective scientists. We need to write in third person, but that's not how people talk. I encourage you to write in first person when possible, and if your department forces you, convert it back to third person, but get the clarity from writing an active voice. You can't go wrong. Um, okay, so here's the questionnaire, and I think that, so that's good. I like this detail about the questionnaire. I just wanna know you can get the data. I wanna know what your sample size is gonna be. Do you have enough participants to actually test your hypotheses? And um, here's so you're saying a little bit about the analysis, but I wanna see, okay, uh, yeah, so this is good. This part is good, at least I like this, that you've gone through and set out what methods, modules, and programs you're gonna use. That's really nice. Where I'm a little bit unconvinced is the feasibility of you actually getting the data, what your sample size is gonna be, and that it's enough of a size to test your question. Um, so, oh, here we go. Here's a little bit of a power. Um, and I, I would check this. This looks uh, a little bit small. Oh, and looks like your colleague is saying that these numbers look small. So yeah, you, you've got to check your power calculations, but this is very important. I'm glad you got this in there. That's really relevant to feasibility. Last, I'm looking for timeline and I see nothing on timeline. And that's really important again on feasibility because how are you going to prove to me that 
you can actually do this timeline. When are you getting the data? How does that fit into the trajectory of your PhD? Guys, I hope you found this helpful. Uh, I hope you can, I've drilled into your minds each element of gift, gap, idea, feasibility, timeline, and that you can take a hard look objectively, just like we would be doing together if we were sitting here right now, which we can do through, through our Facebook group and our, our private uh, support programs. Um, Look at your proposals, take a critical eye, be your own worst critic, that is okay. And see if these gift elements are satisfied. 90% of the time, if you get the, the gap and the idea right, you're gonna be well on your way to constructing a winning proposal. All right, stay tuned for the next video. We are gonna be covering all these practical skills that you need to know, but are so often not taught in our universities. And I will look forward to seeing you there.